Oh, hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv, the most millennial, here with the the final-ish episode on that never ever lost at all because it never ever existed at all city of Atlantis. Today I'm here with another bonus episode because again, I am a deep millennial and I simply could not do this whole series on Atlantis and not talk about Milo and his quest for the lost city. That's right, today we're talking about the Disney movie Atlantis, the Lost Empire. I pulled in my friend from Sweet Bitter and the new podcast Cult America, Lisa Charlotte, to talk all things Disney and Atlantis. Now, Lisa and I are both in our early to mid-30s, and because of that, this Disney movie came when we were, like, 13, and thus old enough to pay close attention, but not quite too old for a good Disney adventure movie. For me, it became one of my favorites, but honestly, I can't remember why. Probably the ancient city of it all. But Lisa didn't know anything about Atlantis beyond this movie, which was my intention here. I wanted her to act as a kind of sounding board for all the wildness that is Atlantis now. And boy, did it work. Now, this episode is very casual and fun. Really just two friends chatting. Ostensibly about the Disney movie, but also it turned into a lot of just me ranting about the history of the story of Atlantis, what it is now, all the racist aspects, because... Even though I've been talking about it and researching it for ages now, I haven't, like, had a chance to kind of spew all of this at anyone uh, in person. So, and my mind continues to be blown the more I think about what it started as versus what it is now. I just can't. I can't with it. So, grab yourself a Saturday morning coffee, sit back, and enjoy a truly silly and fun and informative bonus episode on Milo and his ragtag team. Plus just me sharing all the wild and shocking racism and colonialism attached to Atlantis. Honestly, this episode is kind of the perfect cap on my Atlantis series. I feel like I do a lot of recapping with Lisa in this very conversational way. Maybe it's some inspiration for you all to go out and spread the truth of Atlantis and get further inspiration to find more love of real archaeology, real ancient cities destroyed by natural disasters like my beloved Akrotiri. But what about Milo? Comparative colonialism in Atlantis and Disney's lost empire with Lisa Charlotte. So let's just jump right in and make it, this is going to be deeply casual to offset the much more serious episodes of this podcast. So so excited to hear the other episodes though. And I'll listen after this. They are so fun, honestly. I've had so much fun with this. So, but Lisa, thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining me to talk about Atlantis. Oh my gosh. to be here. I'm so excited. I'm, I'm just like, yeah, I... Sorry. It's, it's really <laughs> lame. I'm just like, I actually just realized I know nothing about this. So this is very exciting for me, except for what I saw in the movie, which I, I don't know how accurate Disney is, but. Um. Well, so, okay. That's why I wanted you to do this and to not research it and to just watch the Disney movie very and then hard. come at it totally, just completely blind, which also the Disney movie is so part of our generation too. Like, did you watch it when you were a kid or no? Yes, but I was like, what it's 2001 yeah so I was like 14 Are we the same age yeah 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 so I wasn't really like a kid kid but I was that's true I said kid and of, I was 13 <laughs> yeah I was the oldest of like six so I I think I I watched it with like younger siblings but I think even as a teenager there was a pretty big deal made about this movie like the animation and stuff people made a massive deal about the way it was drawn or what it was it one of the first films to be like computerized because it has that scene very similar to Aladdin where they're like going around with the lava and I was like oh this is that generation of Disney yeah I think it's one of the last like probably one of the er like one of the first that's fully computer that was made with a computer but also one of the last that 
is animated Mm. like in that style you know like in the actual like looks like it is a drawing style versus because i'm thinking toy story was like in the 90s so you know what's toy story in the 90s we were kids when toy story came out it's so hard for me to know because like because my sisters and my well because my brother and sisters are so much younger so like there's a 10 year age gap between my brother and i and then like my sisters are like 14 13 14 years younger I just like have a continuum of children's movies <laughs> that I like watch throughout my young life because my sisters would watch all of their stuff from their generation too. So like it kind of cuts off in like 2004, but like until then it's like just kids movies is my life. Well, here's the thing. I just looked it up. Okay. Toy Story came out in 1995. What? Isn't that fucking no, wild? That's wild. Toy Story 2 was 99. Holy wow. shit. So anyway, yeah. So I think we're pretty deep into computers, I guess, when it comes to Atlantis. But I certainly think it's one of the last that was like that traditional animation and not mm. like in the style of Toy Story. Yeah. I just remember there being a big like hubbub around it. Mm. And it's really beautiful. Like, and everybody's really hot, which like, <laughs> why? Like I, we were watching it and I was just like, why is everybody like super like swole, like very hot? <laughs> Um, I feel uncomfortable fanning myself. Like, I don't know. They're no Robin Hood the Fox. I mean, we're talking about crushes, <laughs> animation crushes, but God. the doctor was like huge. Oh yeah. Muscles. And then you've got these gorgeous babes and they're like, you know, I was just like, wow. Okay. It was good stuff. Yeah. So the biggest thing for me was I wanted you to go into this with like basically only the knowledge of Disney's Atlantis, which is how I came to Atlantis and like what I thought of most before I really did any research into it. So other than seeing this movie, like, do you have any major thoughts about Atlantis or I guess even in relation to this movie too, like what, what do you think of as being the Atlantis story myth, what have you, like, what is your impression of Atlantis as somebody who has not researched it? So I don't know, like, I think they will kind of roll into one for me because this is not the only story of like a lost city, right? Like there is another movie, Disney movie. About, Road to like, El Dorado? Yeah, about <laughs> which is like bisexual, iconic film uh, about a lost city. I feel like it's very like Indiana Jones too. So like, I don't know if I have a clear picture of Atlanta specifically. I don't know why, but I always thought that like, there's some like eternal youth thing going on. And maybe I've seen that in another piece of media as well Mm. and not just here because I feel like there was like a fountain but maybe I'm thinking of another lost city (laughs) (laughs) that isn't Atlantis because they all kind of roll into one for me but literally this is like all I knew and I honestly couldn't remember so much of this film and it's actually really wild like it's way more wild than I remember. We were watching it all like all of us had not seen it since we were kids Uh, I had like a friend over and I was watching with my roommate And we were all like, I don't remember this. Like, it gets really mean. It's like, it's all about colonialism, A. Like, the whole movie is just like, colonialism, ever heard of it? And then like, (laughs) and then like, it's really violent and horrible. And then the guy's just like, no, fuck you too. And just like, oh, wait, can I curse? I can curse, right? Absolutely. I already did. I mean, (laughs) I can't even tell. It's such such an important part of my vocabulary. Um, He's like, fuck you. I'm going to betray you as well. I'm like, this film is horrible it's so interesting like it really is dark and i think that that kind of encapsulates the truth of atlantis and i don't mean like the ancient truth but the modern one which Mm. is really interesting tell me about that yeah so i mean the long and short of it is i think especially if you didn't have that kind of necessarily growing up but i think i've always just assumed that atlantis was a greek myth right like There's so much about it that feels like a Greek myth. It's used in so many places. Like it's also, I think, in Aquaman, which I did not see because it looks like one of the worst movies ever made. Um, Even if Jason Momoa is very hot. But people are really hot in it, so I'm. I haven't seen it yet because people have told me it's bad. But like, I'm tempted to just watch it for the hot. Yeah, I mean, I I would support that. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that could be a Patreon episode. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) It feels like a good like myths baby pirates crossover because it's in the sea. Mm. and it has mythology perfect all right we're stretching here but i think we can do a bonus episode for both of us on that deal let's watch (laughs) aquaman oof oh (laughs) well yeah so atlantis just it feels like a myth i feel like everyone thinks it's a myth even just i did this instagram live to promote the series today and even just the fact that i was working with um with my like 
ACAS people who hadn't, uh, who hadn't like experienced the episodes yet. Even they were saying using the word myth, because I think that's what you think of when you think of Atlantis. Like it just, it seems like a Greek myth. Everyone just assumes it's a Greek myth. It has all these Greek qualities, or certainly it is from ancient Greece. And then, so the assumption is then it's a story about a lost world. So obviously it has to be Greek mythology. Um, well, they quote Plato at the start, right? Yes. Yes. Which kind of like also lends itself to that too, you'd think. Well, but it kind of, I guess so. I guess if you don't really if you don't know, know about context, mythology. Yeah. Yeah. So it, because, yeah, it is Plato. And mm. so that, but essentially, you know, at the beginning too, I, I love, it kind of opens with, you know, him making all these points to, <laughs> you know, what ends up being like an audience of cleaning supplies. But basically... I think you you look at this and you're kind of like, wow, that seems like convincing. Like he's got a lot of a lot of facts about Atlantis and where it is and all this like history of all these people talking about it and stuff. Yeah. And so it, it just seems like it is this Greek myth and they do quote Plato at the top. But of course, you know, they they quote Plato quite accurately. Plato is the Atlantis um, source, but he is the only Atlantis source and he is not a mythographer. So in truth of it, Atlantis is a hundred percent just a a piece of dialogue written by Plato to prove a philosophical theory. Interesting. Yes. Was it colonialism? (laughs) I mean, no. I mean, because that's what the movie felt like. So I'm just curious. Well, so we'll get to the colonialism because that is definitely accurate, but not in the way the movie suggests. Okay. So Plato invented Atlantis fully invented Atlantis. There isn't a single source before Plato. There isn't a single source after Plato that isn't just referencing Plato. And there isn't a single piece of visual representation or visual reference in the ancient Greek or Roman or Egyptian world. The story of Atlantis comes from Plato. It's in these two dialogues where they're they're basically like making points. So Plato always wrote in dialogues, right? All of his philosophical theories are written out as if a conversation took place between a bunch of people and it was then written down. The Mm -hmm. people are always real, but the conversations are fake. Okay. So in this case, like Socrates is there. Socrates is always there. He's in every one of Plato's pieces. There's a good joke that the, the wonderful classics meme guy on Twitter made on my show uh, that Socrates was invented by Plato to sell more philosophy because <laughs> basically everything we know about Socrates or anything we know of his words is from Plato. But all of like, at least in the case of this, this dialogue, Socrates was long dead by the time Plato wrote this dialogue where Socrates features in. And so Socrates a- was Plato's mentor or like an elder? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's a lot older and he was dead by the time Plato was writing these things. I don't know okay. how long that they were you know, alive together. I haven't looked into that because I don't care about philosophy other than just (laughs) learning about Atlantis. (laughs) But I know by the time the Atlantis dialogue was written, Socrates had been dead for like, I think it's like 20 years at least. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he was long dead. And and so Plato wrote this piece and basically it's a follow-up to his Republic, which is his most famous piece. And the Republic is this examination of an ideal state And sort of looking at how an ideal state would function, what makes it ideal, all these different things. He has all these, you know, varied ideas on that. And then basically he wrote that. And I think it's like 10 years later, he wrote this one. And it's kind of a follow up where it's looking at the notion of an ideal state and how that state would uh, react or how they would handle war. Mm -hmm. And so like in the story of Atlantis, in this dialogue, it's literally like Atlantis is this you know, this ancient state is supposed to be 9,000 years before, or more like 9,200 years before Plato, which of course there's nothing, <laughs> nothing remotely resembling anything like high tech back that then. That we know it of. <laughs> Do not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I saw but the, the movie live. Don't try well, to the, tell me. <laughs> so in the key and the thing that this movie leaves out and that every other representation of Atlantis tends to leave out is that alongside this idea of this 9,000 year old state, super, you know, evolved state like Atlantis is an equally evolved 9,000 year old Athens. Mm. So in, in order to believe Atlantis, you have to also believe that there was a, an Athens 9,000 years before, which we know archeologically and scientifically that there wasn't, which is what makes it so interesting. Cause anytime there's ever presented this idea that Atlantis was real, they always leave out Athens because it immediately disproves the point 
Mm. That's so interesting. It, it really, like the way that it's like in culture and it's hard because it's hard to know if this is because of the Disney movie, right? It's the same thing with a lot of pirate stuff that we like talk about on Sweet Bitter. It's like, we'll talk about this like pirate behavior and like, is it real? Like, but we just think it's real because we grew up with this Disney pirates. Man, Disney do a lot of shit. But like, <laughs> but like, do we think Atlantis is much more of a big deal because we watched this movie when we were younger and like, I can't remember this movie not existing. Like I remember it, I remember it coming out and simultaneously, I don't remember what my view of Atlantis was before this movie, if that yeah. makes sense. That's exactly um, how I feel. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's interesting to think about. And it's like the way that like, I don't know, like, I think a lot of these things are funny. I think, uh, you know, the Dan Brown, um, the Da Vinci oh, Code. Oh, Da Vinci Code. Yeah. Coming out when we were like teenagers. Right. And like, then all of a sudden everybody has all these conspiracy theories about, Leonardo da Vinci and like the uh, the Pope and like all this shit and it's like it's so much a part of like our formative years that you're like okay it's just like in our psyche now yeah so like what is real and what is. yeah but what it's is... just fucking Plato like this one guy it's just why I keep telling us every single time we've got to go and like make ourselves seem more relevant to future people <laughs> like seriously it's like station 11 that shit just like just two, five copies but like make sure they're in like the fully right hands and like you know It'd be great. So, okay, that, that like, I think leads to a good question for somebody, again, who didn't know these details. So how do you think, like, if you were to try to guess how the story went from Plato talking about, actually, you know what? No, before we get into that, I'm going to tell you one more important detail about okay. Plato's version, and i.e. the only original version of Atlantis, mm -hmm. which is that not only did they exist alongside Athens that was also 9,000 years older, but they essentially, he just lays out these two cities, like because he's looking at it as from a point of view of what is an ideal state and what is an ideal state do and how do they react it's difficult to tell it as though it's a story which is why it's also crazy to me that it has become a story because it's pretty explicitly not it's like a description of Athens 9,000 years prior what were they like he basically lays them out almost as if they're they kind of sound like an ideal communist utopia Athens mm -hmm. this 9,000 year old Athens specifically he's like okay everyone has their job um, everyone has like the, the thing that they do and they rule themselves and like, it's, it's kind of like what I think, you know, people want communism to, or I should say leftists want communist to communism to be well, versus I mean, you study the theory. That's what exactly. communism is. It's yeah. just being corrupt. Versus like, what it has been in communism. practice. Yeah. In practice is the same thing with like capitalism in theory and practice. Like yes. capitalism in practice, we wouldn't be bailing out banks. Like, but in, yeah. <laughs> in practice, it's, like that's what we're doing, right? But like theoretically, that's not capitalism is. So like neither of them have been, they've both been like ruined by people. Yeah. Also, yeah, like, so I think it, Disney it, Atlantis had a monarchy, so whatever. Well, no, so exactly. <laughs> because I'm, what I'm saying is Athens was kind of this communist ideal state. Ah. Whereas, so he just, he first describes Athens as being this perfect, like they ruled themselves. They had the, you know, they each had their own jobs. They protected each other. They had this like warrior class that did all this protection. And he does throw in a little touch of eugenics okay um, of so he very specifically is like they only ever had twenty thousand citizens and you're like oh how only did they ever. do that <laughs> exactly twenty thousand all the time you want in old one out that's how it goes yeah wow yeah so you know we just every time i was trying to describe this in the episode where i was like the eugenics isn't the point but i'm also <laughs> going to point it out <laughs> You're always going to point out eugenics. Yeah. So basically that's how he lays out Athens. And then he moves on to Atlantis and he's like, Atlantis was kings. And so Atlantis, comparatively to Athens, Atlantis was run by a series of kings. I'm going to forget how many they were because I wrote these episodes so long ago and then let Atlantis just kind of fall from my head a little bit. But I think it was about 10. Like there was a, mm -hmm. there was a bunch of kings and they ruled Atlantis. And At they the were same all time? Yes. So they each ruled these different regions and they were all sons or grandsons, like as the generations went on of Poseidon. So okay. he also links Atlantis more specifically to the gods. Like he does say, you know, that Athens was Athena and Hephaestus's city. Like he's connecting that to the reality that he lived in, in classical Athens, but he doesn't really harp on them. He's just mm -hmm. kind of like, yes, it's Athena and Hephaestus's city, but Poseidon is the father of Atlantis. Like that's the difference. Mm-hmm. And 
And so then he goes on about these kings and the riches of Atlantis, how much gold and various other things that they had. They were super rich. They were run by kings. And then he dives more into the eugenics of it by saying that they were like really good and virtuous until their their divine blood became too mixed with humanity. And Ooh. then, yes. <laughs> and then they developed hubris and they became, they became like bad. He explicitly says that the kings would kill whenever they wanted, whoever they wanted. Like they got to exact their own form of justice. They became tyrannical. He mm. lays out the kings of Atlantis becoming explicitly tyrannical. So he basically is like, Athens, good. Atlantis, bad. They went to war. Athens won the war. And then the gods destroyed Atlantis. So, okay. Yes. So Very he lays different. out Atlantis as explicitly bad and mm. Athens as explicitly good, which is what I find so fascinating because then that leads me to the question I started asking you before, which is if you were to like, I mean, hearing that story of actually the original story of Atlantis and then looking at how it is now seen as a utopia mm. that is lost and there's never any mention of Athens. Like, how would you imagine that it became like that? Like, what what would have had to happen in the last 2,000 years? I mean, a lot's happened in the last 2,000 years. <laughs> I would say that, if I'm going to hazard a guess, that some fucking monarch was like, I want to share, like, a good utopian view of monarchistic... That's not the word, is it? Of a monarchy <laughs> society, however you would say that. Like, I want to show a good view of that. So I'm going to hold this up as like a utopian society that's a monarchy. That's my guess. I could be, I'm probably wrong. It's simpler than that. And the simple okay. answer is simply colonialism. Okay, cool. So it's close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's colonialism, not about monarchy. It's more about, um, so what it, yeah, it's basically just like straight up racism. <laughs> oh my God. Something yeah. really different for us. It's, I just, it's so wild to me because I think when you're, when you're looking at Atlantis from the outside, just as like a regular human, you would never necessarily guess that because it just seems like this ancient Greek myth of a lost city or a lost mm. utopia, or just even the story of a utopia, just as a, you know, almost in the same way of like the Trojan war, like, you know, the Trojan war is a myth. You think Atlantis is a myth in the same way, like just mm. the myth of a utopia or whatever. But all of that came in the last 500 years, straight up just with colonialism. Interesting. <laughs> because it started with Thomas More, who wrote Utopia, which I only know from the movie Ever After, by the way. Same. Thank you. Probably my favorite Cinderella ever. I'm obsessed with it. That's a great it. movie. It's it a great is movie. truthfully amazing. We can talk about it another time. I it's absolutely so love movies from my childhood. It's so good. It's immaculate. Cast is immaculate. Whole absolutely. Thing is great. Drew Barrymore's accent, immaculate. Oh, everything is everything is great. Even even that. No, I know. I love it. So <laughs> Don't care. Uh, um, yeah. So I, that's also all I know about Utopia. But I basically <laughs> just what I learned is essentially that somehow Atlantis comes in there, but it comes in even more specifically in Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis, mm -hmm. which was. I don't know the specifics around how it was related to Atlantis, but it was in some way related to the story of Atlantis and the Americas. The why well, should that I the put discovery. Americas in quot mm -hmm. quotations? But I mean the discovery of the Americas mm -hmm. in air quotes. Um, and so it immediately is starting to connect. It's sort of that's when people were reminded of the idea of Atlantis, mm -hmm. or more so that I suppose they were given a reason to think of it as anything other than Plato's notions or philosophical theories. But that didn't really start the danger of it, the like really bad. It was sort of just there. I mean, it was sort of amongst all the other bad that is colonialism. Yep. But then this Minnesota senator. What? Yes. That's never a good start to a sentence. Never. <laughs> never. His name was Ignatius Donnelly. Okay. And he wrote this book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. Okay. And he basically is the one who decided that he had, you know, proven that Atlantis was real and that the right people just had to go look for it. And he also is the first one to make an explicit connection between Atlantis and the Aryans. 
Ah, but they're not Aryan in the Disney movie. No. So I yes, you're bringing me back to the Disney movie because now I'm just giving this whole like detailed thing about Atlantis. <laughs> no, but I'm really interested. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that's what's so interesting though is knowing these pieces and then looking at the Disney movie because basically it all became this really dark mess of people have found a way to decide that that the Atlanteans were Aryan, even though Plato explicitly says it was like right next to Spain, Portugal, and Africa. Like mm. it was right beyond the Strait of Gibraltar. And so it's like, well, I don't think they would be particularly Aryan, but okay. <laughs> and so, and actually Atlantis like controlled a bunch of Africa and stuff in Plato's, in Plato's story. But these white people in the last 400 years decided that no, it's actually the homeland of the Aryans which has then spurred on like the Nazis went looking for Atlantis to find the Aryan what? homeland. Yes. They had a whole subset of like um, Himmler was searching for Atlantis, like literally had a Nazi group. There was a name for it. I forget what it is. Yeah. And then Disney made a movie about this. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and Disney and made a movie brown? about this. And, yes, exactly. That's what's so interesting to me. Because I also, I don't think the last time I watched it, I registered how much they're not meant to be white. Yes. Like, and it's even so. The, even the team is not all white, which no. stuck out to me because of the time of it. Like, that was even quite unusual. People had really thick accents. They're from all over the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a really one of the most diverse Disney movies. <laughs> It's to the point where I was reading the IMDb trivia and actually uh, the doctor, Sweets, is the one who's a doctor, I think, right? Yeah. So, and this is, you know, this is IMDb trivia. So we'll see who's to say exactly how <laughs> accurate it is. But what it says is that it's one of the first Disney films to feature an African-American character as an important secondary character. Mm. I was blown away because 2001. 2001. <laughs> mm. Like, are we surprised? But I was actually amazed. And also, I think not even that they were, uh, not even that it was diverse, but that there was a diversity in voices too. Like Mm -hmm. the voices of people sounded like the accents of where they would be from. Like it felt proper. Yeah. Which like is something that like doesn't always happen. But that's just, yeah, felt very unusual to me. I don't remember it being so diverse. Like I guess I always thought about Milo and like Mm -hmm. I didn't think about anything else. Yeah. But it's it's a beautiful film. Like, it was really, and very dark, way darker than I remember. No, So part of me now seeing it again too, like part of me really wonders whether they were making some kind of conscious effort to push back against the Nazis looking for it, like the way that it's been connected to Arianism mm. and whether they were trying to almost be like, we can have Atlantis without that. And maybe I'm giving them too much credit. I very easily probably. could be. Joss Whedon's one of the writers, so probably. Joss Whedon was one of the writers? Credit. I know. We saw it at the end and we were like, whoa, there's like four writers attributed and one of them is Joss Whedon. Uh, but I think it's a bunch of white dudes because I was actually interested. I did look into it. I was like, is this like written by people of color? Because it feels like, you know, it's making a statement about colonialism and maybe that's like not as intentional as it seemed to be because it seemed like quite heavy handed. But um, no, I think it's a bunch of white dudes. Yeah. Surprisingly diverse cast. Yeah. I was very surprised. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. And then not only just the cast and the the actual, like, the characters themselves, but also the iconography they use and the mm-hmm. visuals of Atlantis is very indigenous looking. Like, they very much mm. took iconography from the Americas and Africa and put it Mm. all together and made it into Atlantis. Like it is deeply not European art iconography, which I think is super interesting and important and accurate in terms of where Atlantis would have been were played as opposed to the fact that it's a Greek myth and it's not like all Greek. Exactly. Yeah. It's not, doesn't resemble Greek at all. It's not like Hercules. It's not, it's not like Hercules. No, (laughs) no, but they even like the, you know, the, the statues and things very much look like South American kind of style. And then Mm. there's other like iconographies and things that definitely look like they took inspiration from Africa, like in African mythologies and things as well, which is really interesting to me, especially Mm. for Disney. Um, but especially yeah, for, for Atlantis being something that is, if it is known for anything, it's that it's Greek. Yeah. 
which of course mm-hmm. is more accurate too, though. Like if you're looking at Atlantis, like if you, if you were to take away the fact that Plato is a philosopher who never had any intention of writing about an actual lost city, um, you know, if Atlantis was ever meant to be anything real, it would have been beyond the pillars of the Heracles, the Strait of Gibraltar, and it would have been explicitly not Greek. That's why they're the bad guys. They're barbarians. They're explicitly not Greek fighting against Athens, the Greeks who win, right? Like it's literally a Greek success story, but it's about Athens prevailing against the barbaric Atlanteans, which is why it's it's so interesting. It's become that they're the utopia. Yeah, they're the utopia. And it's like this story seems to be that they're coming into like, basically like colonize this place that carries its own beauty and power that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And they're just kind of coming in gung ho. Um, wow, they really twisted that around. Yeah. And now some other pieces, some interesting things that Disney uses and where they've come from too. So, you know, all the crystal, the crystal power sources and things. Yeah. So all of that comes from later interpretations of Atlantis, like from the last three or 400 years where people have put um, this, I learned the word conspirituality. Okay. Yeah. And I think that that's more used for studying these things, but basically there was a spirituality kind of movement and, um, oh, there's a, there's a term. I was just editing this episode yesterday. I should know better, but basically there was this group of people, this woman specifically started it and then it kind of went from there. Her name is Helena, Helena Blavatsky. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this like enormous thing of these theories on what she called root races. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. So again, we get into another, (laughs) another aspect of, I don't know which direction this is going. So I don't know how to respond. No, no, it's not not good. (laughs) I don't think she necessarily like harped on the Aryan of it all, but she definitely brought in a lot of deeply racist aspects of it. Okay. Yeah. So it's just another part where, in the last 500 years, people just began taking Atlantis and making it racist. (laughs) And so, yeah, she has this like list of all of these root races and things like this, but she started it with this, uh, with this one movement. And then another, like a couple of other people, I think took hold of it from there. And at some point, somebody inserted this idea of a crystal power source. Okay. That that is like the source of all of Atlantis's power. Of course, Plato literally is just like, it's an ancient city. And there's a lot of water (laughs) like because it's interesting to me, like never having really thought about it because it's obviously like Plato didn't write about anything that was particularly advanced for his own time. Like he literally just wrote about a theoretical place that looks and sounds like the world he lived in. He didn't Mm. like imagine something new. He wasn't writing science fiction. Like he just was like, okay, this is an older place. It's an older, you know, it's 9,000 years older, but he basically just describes the world around him. And that's what makes it so it's just so interesting and and very clearly like not ever meant to be based in history, but it has all these different aspects that run through the gambit of colonialism to straight up overt racism and Aryanism and Nazism and generally like inserting these like religious aspects to it as well. And spiritual aspects of this lost city. And it is just the amount that it has been like taken away or from the, the Plato of it all. And then, Oh, anyway, now I'm, again, I'm just rambling about Atlantis. Cause I feel like that's but all you I You know do. what makes me angry about yes. that is that like, I knew what Atlantis was and I didn't know who Sappho was. And yes. that feels to me to be deeply wrong. Absolutely. Like, she is like a real person who really existed and was incredibly important. I have never heard her name until like a few years ago. And then what the fuck I know all about Atlantis? Come on. Like, that seems ridiculous. Yes. That's the thing. Uh, That's, I think, such a huge part of it is that Atlantis has become this incredibly famous, like arguably one of the most famous concepts from ancient Greece. And it is not actually really ultimately a concept from ancient Greece. Like, it's an anecdote 
Plato, this is why my logo for the series of episodes is Plato doing a face yeah. bomb. Because he, <laughs> like, this is so deeply not his intention. The Timaeus and the Critias, which is these dialogues, are, like, these smaller works. They're barely ever printed. Like, literally no one cares about them. But somehow they spawned what we think of as Atlantis today, which is ultimately ba- barely, if at all, resembles what Plato actually wrote. There is a king. And there is water, yes. so we have those two things. Yes, but just one king, in just one the king. Disney one, yep. And then no, they have the masks of the old kings. Is that supposed to represent the ten kings? Oh, maybe. That's kind that of sounds right. You know, when you said that, that's what it felt like. Yeah, like I the just they they went with they basically took a lot of the the conspiracy aspects. You know, adding the crystal energy sources and the like super high tech, like, you know, they've basically got flying cars and stuff, which all comes from the last like 300 years and just people inventing this wild wildness of Atlantis. So the Disney stuff is just it's so interesting to me because I really think that they subverted a lot of the colonialism that that is inherent in what we think of as Atlantis today, not actually what Plato wrote. I mean, Plato, Mm. again, there's a touch of eugenics in there, so it wasn't good, but it was not about colonialism, you know? So it's just, yeah, it's really, it's really quite interesting. And they, this they seem to have avoided a lot of the racist aspects of a story that is deeply racist. And for Disney, I'm pretty impressed. I mean, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. Mm. Um, I have a question. Please. Have I'm people not really about. tried? So aside from the Nazis, mm. are there people still trying to find Atlantis? Like yeah. Now? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really big believers and conspiracy theorists. And it's like a huge thing. That's actually been one of my bigger fears of putting these episodes out. Am I going like, to be hated on Twitter? <laughs> you're probably going to be fine. <laughs> They're going to come for me <laughs> first. <laughs> But for don't real, like, me. I don't know anything. Oh, people will come into my Twitter, just they'll word search like Atlantis Atlanta's. and just find people talking about oh, yeah. it. It's wild. Um, but no, there's like a huge subset. You know, there's a huge world of YouTubers, right? It's the same type of people who watch Al- ancient aliens and believe it. The same type of people mm. who question whether the pyramids were built by the Egyptians. It's, it's. I mean, aliens is more believable than Atlantis at this point. <laughs> From what I understand about Alanis, like there is probably there is probably some kind of life. Now, is it what we think it is in like a green man coming down? But like there's probably life. Oh no, no. And I don't mean aliens. I mean ancient aliens, right? Okay, I mean, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean the people like, who think aliens. No, yeah. like the people who think aliens built the pyramids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I understand. The people who make it racist. <laughs> aliens are fine. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't make it racist. I think that's without, yeah, people don't seem capable of that. No, no, definitely not. But no, there's been recent documentaries. And what it actually ends up being is that because Atlantis is so well known and something that people find so interesting, it tends to be that even if the documentaries aren't coming at it from the racism of it, they're still causing actually a lot of damage because by spending time and resources looking for something that is inherently never going to be found because nobody ever talked about it as if it was real. (laughs) Like by spending this time and resources, you take away from like actual archeology span or you make archeology span seem to be something that it's not like I've spoken with a lot of archeologists for the series who specialize in pseudo archeology, span which is what this is like Mm -hmm. using what looks like archeology span to, but you're just kind of proving a preexisting point. Like if I go in thinking, Atlantis is real. I'm going to prove Atlantis is real. You know, like that is deeply problematic because science. I'm going to ignore all the things. That's just that... how everybody does science now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how everybody does science in this century with YouTube and things like that. But yeah, they just find things that reinforce their beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And so there's even like a recent documentary on like big channels with big names attached to it. And it's, it's just, it's quite a, it's quite a wild thing because I also think you can't, talk about Atlantis with any seriousness and ignore the fact that yeah like it was it has such racist roots that the Nazis were looking for it you know you Mm. can't you can't talk about looking for Atlantis and not address that fact that there's so many different things because and not only the Nazis looking for it but there's it's also used often in white supremacist circles as a way to get away from the out of Africa theory Mm -hmm. like if white the whitest of white people actually came from Atlantis, then they can say that they, not everybody came from Africa, you know? Oh my God. There are so many things to worry about. (laughs) 
Like there are so many things to worry about and this is what you're worried about. Like, come on. It's just so ridiculous. Like, I just cannot with this shit. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. I'm just like, I'm like, there's a pandemic. Climate change is coming for us all. And like, people are just like, I'm not from Africa. There's just a city. <laughs> it's a city of white people. Lost city of lost white city. people. Ignore Decided. the fact that if it were real in the right place, they also would not be white. <laughs> <laughs> because those are people who are like it's in the north atlantic it's in you know the pacific or something i don't know if pacific's a normal guess for it but i know that there's definitely a world where people think it is up in the north atlantic because they can make it whiter that way <laughs> and it's just like if you would want to ignore every single thing that actually existed in the ancient world like i mean I, but we already do that right <laughs> like people use like ancient greece as like the part of civilization when like Greek people weren't even considered white in most places until like the last what 50 years not even yeah like Greek people were treated like they weren't white in Australia we have like a massive Greek population for years it's only recently that we would even consider them a little bit white and even then they're still like othered in a way because it's also not like it's people also separate modern Greeks from ancient Greece because with ancient Greece they can you know just look to this, yeah, quote unquote, Western civilization, the founders of it all. And then, but then modern Greeks are kind of, it's like they get the completely different status as if it's a different place, even remotely. I mean, people think Jesus is white, so are we surprised? Well, exactly, right? Like the way that racism can just end up whatever it wants at any given time, just by fudging everything that is real. Great. Yeah. So this conversation totally devolved away from Atlantis or from Disney's Atlantis, which I kind of knew it would because of all this information that I have, but I needed to just uh, spout it all out. Have a casual conversation and like, you know, wax poetic about the city of Atlantis, um, which doesn't exist. That's the thing. There's no way to wax poetic about it. There's no way to really talk too much about what Disney did without knowing everything that's behind it. That said... (sighs) You know, Disney did some interesting things. Oh, I really like the, um, I I took one note because I was just very enthralled. And my favorite line was when um, he said he was an adventure adventure capitalist. Ooh. I was like, that's very clever. (laughs) And that's even more, like it hits even harder now, like in 2022 when like venture capitals become such a bigger, more well-known thing. Like I don't even know if, if they were nodding to venture capitalism in 2001 but he was like i'm an adventure capitalist and i was like that's a great line and um that's a really great way to describe being a colonizer um (laughs) or like a mercenary i think he was describing himself being a mercenary he's like i'm an adventure capitalist and i'm like okay sir um that's like my only note and then aside from that it was like i was just like very uncomfortable about how hot everybody was (laughs) that was like very confusing to me also there was a few very like I, I really miss this about kids' films. Like, kids' films used to have stuff in there for the adults. Yes. And, like, there was some real stuff in there for the adults. And you're like, whoa, this is for kids? Like, the whole thing with, like, um, oh, what was it? It was, like, I can't remember. But there was, like, a whole bit. And you're like, wow, that just went over kids' heads. But, like, I am I laughing thought. at it now. <laughs> I miss this being in kids' films. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean... I just generally really like it, which is why I wanted to have this episode. And then I sort of assumed I would be able to talk about it more without just rambling on about the wild nature of Atlantis. But I just think I'll still never get over learning all of this because like I just grew up watching the Disney movie and thinking Mm. of Atlantis as this idea, this Greek myth of a lost city. And then I go a big movie for your childhood, like fairly big, but mostly because I loved ancient Greece. Right. Mm. Like, and it's not hugely about it, but I think just because I was able to make those connections I still really liked it. I mean, it definitely wasn't like my, the biggest one, but it's sort of still, like you were saying before, it was, it's still formative in my understanding of Atlantis. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there other movies about Atlantis? Are you covering other movies about Atlantis? Or No, I'm one? not covering any other ones. There are definitely like a lot of play- things that feature it. Like Stargate Atlantis is something that people have been mentioning a lot to me, which I have not oh, actually yeah. watched, but that's like a whole thing. Is related Stargate to filmed in Australia? I think it was. That sounds very Maybe possible. Not. Oh, I'm thinking of something else maybe. I don't know. But yes, Stargate's a good fun show. Yeah. I don't think I've seen Stargate Atlantis. I've seen some of Stargate. Yeah, I've not but, seen any um, of it, I'll admit. But people have been quote, like love sending me stuff like that. Yeah. 
And the only other thing I'm covering in terms of pop culture in Atlantis is Assassin's Creed Odyssey uses Atlantis. Um, oh, nice. Which is d- definitely like pulls a lot of the more of the ancient Greece stuff of it all, which is also interesting. It's interesting mm. the ways the two use it because it's so different. Like Disney clearly wanted to use, like wanted to make it not particularly Greek and make it look otherwise. And I think what they were doing is they got a lot of their research from these later sources, right? Like the people who made it into this idea of crystal energy sources and not Greek and, you know, a homeland for others and all of these different things. But there are cute little, a couple of cute little like Disney Easter eggs in there. The main one being that the uh, Italian guy who is named, interestingly, his name is Lorenzo Santorini, which is a nod to what is l- possibly plato's inspiration for the story in his telling is that is the ancient eruption of thera okay yeah are you familiar with that no so thera erupted in the bronze age in like 16 or 1700 bc and thera is now santorini but it it was thera before because it was a island that was a volcano that erupted and left Mm -hmm. just a mess of a crater that's why santorini is actually like circular in shape Oh, so wow. a lot of people think, yeah, that Plato would have seen the circular island and then gotten an I- the idea to invent the circular island city of Atlantis because Atlantis is, it is very circular, circular in the circular. movie as well. Yeah. And that's very, that's very much in the Plato, like the rings of water versus the mm-hmm. island and things. Yeah. And so it's very likely they'd got that the, and the idea of just generally being destroyed by a natural disaster because it is, ba- is a lot of people, you know, consider it one of the big um, starting points for the Bronze Age, quote unquote, collapse or the decline, because it was a volcano that was the eruption was bigger than Vesuvius by a lot. And it's actually one of the biggest volcanic eruptions that we have in like record of humanity basically like it would have completely changed the face of the mediterranean there would have been incredible tsunamis and displacement you know loads of refugees and everyone else in the region having to deal with the refugees in there and it so it would really like fully changed the face of the mediterranean and affected everyone so everyone would have been pretty well aware of the idea of it you know plato would have come like 1200 1300 years later but even he would have been able to see the effects of that and maybe be inspired by the just the general notion of it but it's really interesting and it's sort of a good example of like real archaeology being so much more interesting because yeah like what was left on Thera we have um there's this one city that we call Akrotiri and it was basically preserved by the eruption in the same way that Pompeii was only it's 1600 years older than Pompeii. Wow. And it you can you see the that? wall paintings. No, but I've seen the wall paintings in Athens because they've <laughs> moved a few of them over there. Uh-huh. But yeah, you can like see the ancient preserved Bronze Age city and wall paintings and all of this incredible stuff that we have preserved because of this volcano. And interestingly, they haven't found any bodies on Thera and it, they haven't, you know, excavated the whole of it. So there still could be some, but they think most people got out and they actually escaped by ship to uh to Crete and elsewhere that's but incredible exist. yeah isn't that wild like they must have seen it pop in and just yeah been like, like let's go yeah like way more so than in Pompeii where you know Pliny famously was like I'm gonna see how this goes oh my gosh yeah wow that's so interesting yeah this is the thing that I always find like we keep retelling these stories and we keep like making shit up And like history itself is very interesting. And like, there are a lot of untold stories that are not being told. And yet we still focus on the same fucking things. Like we're still making like, you know, more franchise movies or redoing old movies or whatever. And it's like, you could just, there's be a fucking movie in that. Amazing. Yeah. That's the thing. Interesting stories. Yeah. That's, thank you for very eloquently putting my point because I just feel like I've lost it today but that is kind of the point of why I've done these episodes generally is to point out what actually exists from Atlantis and therefore let people know that it's not as exciting as you think and actually everyone who thinks who's like making you believe it's that exciting either has an ulterior motive or is like pointedly ignoring the dangers associated with it and Mm. there are so many more exciting things like Thera and just like real archaeology generally and like Sappho like you're saying like the fact that 
everyone knows what Atlantis is. And so few people really know who Sappho is. And so many things like that from the ancient world. I mean, obviously, like the world beyond Greece is a huge, like the perfect example for that, right? We all focus so much on Greece and Rome when the ancient Mediterranean broadly was just as interesting, if not more so, just as ancient, if not in most cases, way more ancient than Greece Mm. and Rome. And we just don't focus on those because of all of the varied levels of racism, both intentional and not. Yes. Yeah, it's such a pity. Um, But that's why I love podcasting. It's true. Got all your people on the niche vibes. They want to find niche content. I mean, it's a great place for it. Yeah, I mean, I'm one to talk with my Greek mythology podcast, but <laughs> at least I'm focusing on women. Hey, exactly. I was about to say it's very important because most stuff you find on Greek mythology is uh, not really focusing on the stuff that you're focusing on, which no. is very important. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is most of our conversations. We're like, oh, my God, you're great. <laughs> and you're, you're great. great. Oh, my God, Sappho. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other like uh, thoughts and feelings or questions or should we just wrap up? Well, it's been really interesting. I, um, I learned so much. I, we talked about how they're hot. Well, <laughs> I, I definitely feel like I turned this episode into just uh, tell Lisa the truth about Atlantis because it's that's great for me. I, I mean, it's truly what like, it's just been blowing my mind so much and I'm never getting over it. So I think it's just what I've become is like, let me just tell you the truth of it because it blew my actual mind. But I think it's been a good, up- good opportunity for me after all of this intense research and like mostly talking to myself and scripted to just like reiterate it to my listeners. And, and have like, a conversation. Holy shit. And stand in for your listeners to be yeah. like, oh my God, this is so interesting. Like just had an image of you like at a bar by yourself with a glass of wine and like somebody has like... <laughs> the great fortune of striking up a conversation with you and you just like bending their ear about Atlantis and like then inching slowly away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not if it was me, but like maybe, maybe. No, no, but people. like a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, A lot definitely. of people. <laughs> but I think ultimately too, I, like the point of this, especially in talking about Disney in whatever way that we did is simply that like, there are okay ways of telling Atlantis. Like I think if, if the movie was made now, I would hope that they would touch upon the dangers of it you know and look at real archaeology I mean I would also hope that they would just make a story about like something that's truthful in the ancient world Um, but even generally I think it's a good example because it does kind of subvert a lot of the racism they are explicitly not white the iconography that they have is explicitly like non-European and lots of those things like they they actually did a lot better than I was expecting But that's all to say, like, we are allowed to enjoy the Disney movie Atlantis. I just want everyone to know the truth and the background behind it, because I think that it that's vital if you're going to enjoy it is to at least know what exists beyond that and not just think of it's it's this lovely Greek myth because it's not it's not. (laughs) But also, where is my Sappho I Love Lesbos Disney movie? Exactly. Yeah. Where is it? I want a bunch of lesbians on the I Love Lesbos. Eating pussy, let's go. Disney, go on. Get Story right there. on it, Disney. Okay, maybe Disney don't want to do that. But like... <laughs> Give us Akrotiri then, at the least. Just something. Oh my God. Something. Yeah. There's just so much. The ancient world was so cool. Oh my God. Mesopotamia and Disney movie about Mesopotamia or ancient so Egypt that this isn't is what Zena did religious. really well. Xena was like, mythology's dope. Let's go. Like, oh let's just do all of that. Oh. Which I just think is great. Like... Why have more shows not done that? Yeah, yeah. Instead, they focus on weird fake things or making up things like in a lot of the other adaptations, just inventing whole aspects of it when the real stuff is so entertaining. Exactly. And Uh, so are you. And so are we. Oh, thanks. All of us. All of us. Ancient world nerds. (laughs) So on that note, why don't you tell my listeners where they can find you and your good Ancient World and Otherwise content? Yes, I have Ancient World content. I have recent history content. Um, I have two podcasts. The first one is Sweet Bitter, which is how we know each other and why I've been on the show before. Season one is all about Sappho. So if you don't know about Sappho, you can learn all about her there. Uh, Season two, we're covering pirates. It's a little less ancient, though we do have some kind of like ancient pirates in there too. Um, my other podcast is called Cult America. It is an American history podcast. It's also about cults. I'm really bad at an elevator pitch for it, but basically <laughs> it's me and my friend who is like a very, very 
proud American talking about how America is a cult. So if you think that would interest you, that's Cult America, wherever you get podcasts. And I'm on Twitter, at Lisa Charlotte, with two E's, like in the title of this podcast. (laughs) Yeah, you can see it very clearly in the title of this podcast. Well, quickly before we go, have I ever told you the myth of Dionysus and the Pirates? No, it's like tell me the myth of Dionysus seconds. and the pirates. Tell it's me. the best. So Dionysus has so many myths, but one of them is this time that I forget how he ended up there, but basically he was like trapped on a ship with pirates and he was trying to get away and he's a god. So what he did was like, he basically caused the whole ship to transform into grapevines and like the grapevines overtook the whole pirate ship. And then the pirates turned into dolphins and they leapt overboard and then Dionysus freed himself. That's a really elaborate way when you're a God to free yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel like that could have been done differently, but it's Dionysus and and that man does nothing without drama. He is the, queer non-binary god of theater oh yes okay now it'll make sense i feel like i need that sound clip to share with our listeners at sweet bitter because that's amazing (laughs) that's i mean queer queer gods escape through grapevines which are obviously associated with wine sounds great Mm -hmm. i mean yeah he's the god of wine primarily exactly fantastic yeah we love we love a god of wine (laughs) oh So this is the first time we've recorded an episode without drinking, by the way. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for doing this. This has been very fun. Well, nerds, that episode was truly off the rails. I'm not sure I've had any that have been quite so casual with moments of me just having to remind myself that, hey, I was being recorded. Alas, that's what happens at the end of a very long and very research intensive series. But hey, that's why it's a bonus, right? (laughs) A bonus that followed up a deeply fascinating and wide ranging episode with an actual archaeologist walking me through the wonders. Oh my gosh, what did you guys think about Steph's episode yesterday? It was incredible. If it isn't clear to you, I recorded the regular conversations with my archaeologist guests many months before these bonus episodes. Now that the Atlantis series is finished, which I can't believe it has, it's taken up so many months of my life now, how do I find my way back into the regular episodes? Well, (laughs) but now that it's finished, I want to know your questions and comments. I want to know what questions were raised buy this series I have on Atlantis that you have now that maybe I didn't answer or you want more details on. And I want to hear your comments. I want to hear what you think, having learned all this. What did you think of Atlantis before versus now? What blew your mind most? I just want to hear from you on what you thought of this whole series and Atlantis generally. So to submit your questions, comments, go to mythsbaby.com slash Atlantis and there is a form at the bottom of the page after the episodes. That is mythsbaby.com slash Atlantis. And finally, in the course of this conversation with Lisa, I I somehow forgot to share the most incredible quote from Disney's Atlantis. Truly, I'm not sure whether they meant it to be so powerfully anti-colonialist, but it is. It's a line spoken by the bad guy, the military guy, Rourke, who's representing the horrors of colonialism, trying to destroy Atlantis for its wealth and its power source. And he says to Milo, quote, If you gave back every stolen artifact from a museum, you'd be left with an empty building. And with that, I'll leave you. Thank you so much for listening and bearing with me on this one. Phew, I think I was high on the Atlantis of it all. I'm Liv and I love this shit. This shit today being, I don't know, that incredible quote. The British need to return the Parthenon marbles, among countless other things stolen during their colonialist reign of terror? <laughs>